Welcome to this morning's keynote controversy here at the Battle of Ideas. I'm Claire Fox, I'm the director of the Institute of Ideas for those of you who don't know me and this is for me a very important theme and session which is uh, to discuss the crisis of trust in institutions. It's called Building Trust or Cleaning Up the Public Realm. The crisis of trust in institutions really doesn't need to be rehearsed. Yesterday we actually had a series of discussions on things like the mid-staffs crisis in the NHS, the uh, whole discussion around the police, and the, in the news obviously we've had Plebgate. The Jimmy Savile scandal has re-emerged in the headlines recently that sort of uh, created serious problems for institutions as wide as the BBC and again the NHS. And I was at an event during the week actually at which Margaret Hodge, the MP, has kind of made a new career for herself as being kind of the, not exactly the star chamber, but certainly the person who is going to uh, ask very awkward questions of institutions. And at that discussion, it was very much, well, there is this problem, which is all of the major British institutions have got a, a crisis at some point and the public don't trust them. But it would be rather boring if we simply sat here and gave you that litany of complaints. Apart from anything else, we've been doing that for the last three years at the Battle of Ideas, and it just feels like not the thing to do now. So we've sort of put this discussion on to reflect on a number of things. Why, in a way, this crisis of trust exists is always an underlying question. But also, actually, since this is the ninth Battle of Ideas, and since we've started, there's been actually a whole range of things put in place to rebuild trust, such as transparency initiatives, codes of conduct, uh, standards boards, and so on. And really what we more want to look at now is, if all of these mechanisms are in place, why does there still appear to be declining trust? If, or are they working? What's going on? In fact, sometimes do they backfire? And, and there's a kind of underlying sense of a crisis of authority, I think. One of the things the Institute of Ideas is worried about and wary about is a kind of cynicism that just emerges, which is that everybody just says, don't trust them, they're all liars, they're all not, and so on. And that's not, we think, a healthy political atmosphere. Not because we want to be uh, naive, but because we want to understand things a bit more subtly. So as a consequence of which, we've brought together five people to reflect on this very broad topic. Impossibly, I've asked them to do that in five to seven minutes, no chance. They can possibly deliver you all their thoughts in that time, they're expected to just give an intellectual provocation. So I'm going to introduce you to them in the order in which they'll speak. First of all, we'll be hearing from uh, Brendan O'Neill here, who's just uh, uh, been discussing hip hop and rap and various things to show you a man of many talents. <laughs> He's the editor of Spiked, uh, one of the battle's core uh, media partners. He's a columnist for The Big Issue, a contributor to The Spectator. He blogs daily for The Telegraph. He's been described as one of the country's sharpest social commentators by The Telegraph and as a sub Danny Dyer intellectual wind up merchant by The Guardian. <laughs> um, uh, you can choose, we won't take a vote on it. He's the author of Can I Recycle My Granny and 39 Other Eco Dilemmas? And uh, whatever else he is, he's certainly uh, thought provoking. Mm -hmm. And he's not on Twitter but Twitter appears to be dedicated to him. There is a whole <laughs> industry of anti-Brendan O'Neill tweets out there. Anyway, can we give him a warm welcome, please? Um, next up, we'll be hearing from Paul Davis, who is a partner at PwC in corporate finance. Uh, PwC, as you will know from anyone who was here yesterday and last night, uh, is one of the major partners for the festival and at PricewaterhouseCooper, we've worked with for the last three or four years now on building this festival, but also uh, having the discussions around the trust theme actually within PwC as a company as well for those people who work there. Paul himself specialises in large 
transactions between government and the private sector, uh, including he's worked for the MOD, for the Highways Agency, the DECC, the Department for Transport, local authorities. He's uh, just formed the Green Deal Finance Company, uh, a national not-for-profit public-private uh, partnership. And uh, he's appeared at, he's actually appeared at a number of star chambers, but anyway, he's appeared at the uh, Parliament's Public Accounts Committee, different select committees, um, and uh, um, uh, on infrastructure issues. Can we give Paul a, a, a big welcome, please? <laughs> then we'll be hearing from Jill Rutter. Jill is Programme Director at the Institute for Government, which she joined in 2009. Uh, she now leads the work there on policy making and arm's length bodies. Before that, Jill was the Director of Strategy and Sustainable Development at DEFRA, and before that she was at BP, and that was following a career in the Treasury, where she was uh, Press Secretary and Private Secretary to the Chief Secretary and the Chancellor, and has also done a lot of work on tax, local government, finance, debt, export finance. As it happens, I've, so she's, she's basically covered all of that stuff that goes on behind the scenes, um, and I've also heard Jill speak at various things and uh, been wanting to get her to speak, so I'm just delighted to have her here. Can we give her a warm welcome, please? <laughs> Next up, we'll hear from uh, Lord Victor Adebowala, who is Chief Executive of Turning Point. He's a non-executive director of NHS England, Chancellor of Lincoln University, Commissioner of the UK Commission for Employment and Skills. Yeah, it goes on and on and on. <laughs> President of the International Association of Philosophy and Psychiatry. I was dead impressed by that. That's enough. Um, yeah, that, that's enough on him. Anyway, no, no, but he... I, I think it's... No, but it's really interesting because he's obviously somebody who's very well known in this country of being passionately involved in uh, discussing things like mental health, uh, homelessness, substance misuse, but he's also actually equally passionate about public sector reform, which is one of the reasons why I wanted him here. He's got a CBE, he's a cross-bench peer, but more than anything else, he's always lively and provocative. Can we give him a warm welcome, please? <laughs> and finally, we'll be hearing from Alex Dean, who is Head of Public Affairs at Weber Shandwick, trained barrister, elected common councilman for the City of London, founding director of Big Brother Watch, which was where we originally met, um, and his work I think has contributed to aiding the curbs on surveillance and intrusion into our private lives, although God knows there's a lot of work still to be done. He's the editor of Big Brother Watch, The State of Civil Liberties in Modern Britain, which I consider to be a must-read book. Um, and he was uh, David Cameron's first chief of staff, blogs at conservative.home, and again, always one of those people who throws a spanner in the works intellectually and I enjoy listening to, so I'm delighted to have him. Uh, can we give Alex a <laughs> Um they will do their five to seven minutes. We'll have a quick chat on the panel and then it's open up to the audience for a conversation. But Brendan, kick us off. There's something really weird about today's uh, discussion of trust in public institutions. And the weird thing is this. The institutions and organisations that crow most loudly about a crisis of trust are very often the same institutions and organisations that actively stir up mistrust across society. Uh, the same public bodies which wring their hands over the fact that no one trusts them anymore also do an, an enormous amount to stoke up today's broader climate of mistrust, to inflame the idea that we, the public, cannot trust each other, and in fact that we as individuals cannot trust ourselves. So we have a bizarre situation today where public bodies seem to think they can encourage mistrust among citizens in everyday life and that there will be no repercussions for themselves or for the levels of, of trust they enjoy. But recent developments suggest that that is not the case. So just think about the NHS. Following various scandals, including the Savile stuff and the Midstaffs debacle, the NHS is very worried that people don't trust it as much as they used to, and it's taking all these steps to try to rebuild trust. This is an institution that has done more than perhaps any other institution to stir up mistrust in modern society. If you walk into any NHS facility and the very first thing you see is a poster saying, don't attack our staff. If you attack our staff, we will have you arrested and throw you out and you won't get treatment. Rough translation, we don't trust you. You're volatile, keep at arm's length. The NHS has also acted in the, one, in the words of one of its internal documents as agents of the state effectively spying on citizens. 
NHS workers have kept an eye out for radicalization amongst their Muslim patients, contributing to the idea that Muslims can't be trusted. Midwives are trained to look out for signs of domestic violence among their patients, uh, giving rise to the idea that uh, intimate relationships are probably all quite dodgy. And as for NHS propaganda, it's always telling us to beware other people and to beware ourselves. In its latest uh, safe sex posters, they show a, a room full of young people drinking and dancing and, and getting off with each other next to the words, the only thing standing between you and a nasty disease is a condom. In other words, everyone is diseased, everyone is dirty, everyone is dangerous, so you had better cover up when you touch them. Um, quite why the NHS thinks it can stir up so much social mistrust and yet never be the victim of mistrust is a complete mystery. Or consider care homes for the elderly. Following uh, recent revelations, politicians and officials have set themselves the task of trying to rebuild trust in uh, care homes for the elderly. These are the same politicians and officials who are continually telling us, the public, to be on the lookout for elder abuse. They plaster public spaces with posters showing an old woman's face and the words, it isn't only children who are abused. They give us hotline phone numbers so that we can squeal on any of our neighbours or friends who we think are abusing their elderly relatives. They call on the staff of supermarkets to keep an eye on people who are shopping with the elderly people to make sure that they aren't ripping them off or stealing their Tesco uh, club card points, which is one of the definitions of elder abuse, people who take their parents or grandparents' Tesco club card points. Uh, they tell us there is a hidden epidemic of elder abuse, and yet they expect to remain immune from the consequences of stirring up that kind of intergenerational mistrust. They really believe they can stoke a highly mistrustful panic about old people being at risk and that it won't impact on their own institutions and care homes. Or consider the political class. These people, are, these people crack me up the most. They are obsessed with a lack of trust. In one breath, they will say, why don't people trust us? In the next, they will announce some new policy or initiative designed to inflame today's crippling social mistrust. They make every adult who works with children go through a criminal records check, implying that no adult in the country can be trusted. They put up CCTV cameras on every street corner, in every nook and cranny of the country, suggesting none of us can trust public spaces or the people who inhabit public spaces. They tell us, quote, there is not a town, village, or hamlet in which children are not being sexually exploited, in the words of one uh, of the deputy children's commissioner, uh, seeming to suggest that no one can be trusted not to rape a child. So officialdom constantly stirs up mistrust towards all kinds of human relationships and is then Surprised when the relationships that it presides over also start to corrode and start to be viewed as toxic. Because these institutions are also made up of human relationships. Doctor-patient, patient, uh, doctor, patient, carer, old person, politician, voter. These are human relationships. And if we are to believe that all human relationships are mistrustful and suspicious and dodgy, then they will come to be seen in the same way. The real problem today, I think, is that we are all under extreme cultural pressure not to trust ourselves, not to trust our instincts, not to trust our parenting style, not to trust our attitudes to other people. So our instincts are reined in by police and other officials constantly telling us never to be a have-a-go hero, never to take a risk. Even the more heroic elements of the public sector are now told not to take risks if someone has a gun, not to leap into a lake if someone falls in, and so on. Heroism itself is restrained. It can't be trusted. We're told not to trust our, how we mother our children or father our children. Instead, we have to bow to experts. There are two consequences of this climate of mistrust. The first is a short-term short boon to institutions and experts. They can live off this climate of mistrust in the short term. They can benefit from it and say, you have to do bad to us because obviously you can't trust yourselves or your friends or family. But in the long term, the impact of this climate of trust is to corrode institutions as well. The benefits for them are fleeting. And in the long term, this culture, this misanthropic culture of mistrust that they have done so much to stoke comes back to haunt them. And because they can't face up to this culture, and their responsibility for unleashing it. They instead take refuge in procedure in an attempt to rebuild trust. 
They take refuge in the idea that you can rebuild trust by putting more cameras in old people's homes, by having more transparency, by opening up institutions to even more scrutiny. But of course, this makes the problem even worse. This, these procedural attempts to rebuild trust makes the problem worse, because what it effectively says is that you, the public, can't be trusted, and neither can we, the institutions. They are currently being done over by the very climate of mistrust that they did so much to create. Thank you. Thank you. I was just about to pass you a note, but you timed it perfectly. Thank you very much, Brendan. Well, very provocative, uh, very interesting take on it, and I'm sure we'll come back to many of those things. But, Paul, if I can have your thoughts now, please. Thanks for that. I think um, I was going to um, build on that, actually, because I um, wholly agree with where, where it takes you, and just make uh, about sort of four or five key points. I mean, the first one, yes, that trust has declined, and uh, I think we all get that, uh, but maybe give you some empirical um, data around that, some things that actually show that that seems to be the case. Um, secondly, that trust matters. I mean, who cares, ultimately, if we don't trust each other? But actually, there's more and more economic research about it driving economic growth, and in particular, that trust affects the quality more than the quantity of life. Um, thirdly, I can hit just on a few reasons why trust has declined, and I wholly agree with, with, with um, all of those points, but why they were declined, because they give you thoughts about the policy implications, what you should then do about it. Um, and then, uh, I mean, my thoughts, which I think was probably gleaning from the last presentation as well, which is that reading, re rebuilding trust actually needs less oversight, less regulation, more self-regulation, and more, funnily enough, trust. Um, and if I've got time, and then maybe just give you some ideas of some policy implications, both for government and for companies. So just quickly going back to those in, in order, uh, and I think ultimately the conclusion, I think, is rebuilding trust is not going to be a good outcome, rather than it should be the guiding principle for the public sector uh, in working out what it should be doing from a policy-wise, and a guiding principle for companies in what they do. So trust is not an outcome, it should be a guiding principle. But let me quickly go through those. Trust has declined. Well, yes, and we've just had a, a great, uh, from, uh, from Claire as well, sort of list of things that have gone wrong from, from sort of Savile to across the public sector and the private sector, weapons of, of mass deception, as it would seem, um, uh, what's happened with all the banks, the various controversies on banks. And I got thinking to myself, well, is this unique? Is this new? Because you, you, those with a bit of a memory can think about Watergate, Profumo, uh, Rain Contra, things that have happened in the past. But actually, a lot of surveys say yes. Um, take the British Social Attitude Survey, which is regularly done. So in 1987, was asked the question, uh, asked the question are banks well run? And got 91%, compared to asking it again now, and it got 19%. Now, not, not a great surprise, but yet yeah, 19, so instead of 91. My, my notes say no shit, Sherlock. But they also, um, <laughs> they, they also asked, what about confidence in the press? 1987, 53%, now 27%. And more worryingly, trust in government to place the needs of the nation above the needs of their party, 47% has now gone down to 18%. Mori polls. Um, in 2001, 45% were satisfied with how Westminster was run. By 2009, that's 20%. That in British government works well, a poll in 73 said 48%, now 24%. And trust in professions, well, politicians and journalists score only 19%, I'd be sad to say. Um, and I think the most worrying one was a recent U YouGov poll they did with the Fabians, um, where they asked people to, to score a couple of statements. The first one said, mistakes have been made during the credit crunch, etc. There was nothing fundamentally wrong with British uh, economic system. 15% agreed with that statement. Whereas a statement, it was quite a long statement, said something that there are fundamental problems with the economic system. Governments and companies have to radically change to restore and are not trusted. 67% agree with that. There has been a fundamental shift in what people think about it. Uh, the good news is um, research does say that intelligent people trust more. So you, you guys will believe everything that's said on this committee. But, but uh, um, I, I think the levels of trust have come down to a level which is actually damaging to democracy. And that's the first key point. I think now it's got to a stage where people won't trust and conform and do things within government. And actually making democracy work is uh, at a breaking point. The second question then, does this all matter? Uh, very briefly, yes, for three key reasons. 
The first one, there is a growing uh, bank of evidence that, that trust is actually co uh, either correlates or actually drives economic growth. That the more trusting societies are, the higher their per capita income and the higher their growth rate. Um, and that is causal. So just take a, a microeconomic example. People that trust more apparently um, save more, invest more, keep less in cash, use bank and credit, and will borrow more to invest in things. So simple economic outcomes of what happens in trusting. Second reason is quality of life. And I think the, the debate we will have in politics over the next couple of decades is going to move on away from quantity to the quality of life. And trust is a fundamental part of that. Again, surveys show that um, in trust in society and the trust in government and the companies that we work is an absolute fundamental part of their sense of well-being. It goes hand in hand with belonging, fairness, um, accountability, being heard and respected. All of those actually drive people's well-being. And then the third reason why trust is important is political legitimacy. Effectively, the legitimacy of government is, not, is brought into question if you do not trust them. Um, why has trust declined, was my third question. And uh, I totally agree with, with, with um, everyone else so far, and it's fairly clearly a uh, good reason why. But if I just highlight a couple of good reasons, um, simply because they have policy implications. So the first one clearly is so many individuals and institutions have proved untrustworthy, is a fairly good reason for it to decline. <laughs> Um, but I would agree with all the monitoring and surveillance. There is a lot of adversarial regulatory activity, um, and it doesn't matter how well you do, the regulator feels need to find fault, and I would say the same on politicians. I think politics is getting more political. Uh, I personally don't like the way Margaret Hodge is running those committees and, and the way it's doing it. I think it produces the wrong atmosphere. Um, and it's getting much more, if you like, sound bitey in my mind as well. I don't know about you, I personally would not want my minister to be tweeting. I would want them to think about policy, not to be thinking in nanoseconds. Um, other areas, inequality is driving um, a lack of trust. Inequality and social exclusion itself, so they say, because people are saying, if the government is not representing me, that is eroding trust. Um, and what Alan Milburn described as a persistently unequal uh, society, the UK, that will undermine trust. So I think the causes are public, they're private, and they're individual, and they have driven trust, and I think that takes you to what you should do about it. Um, very broadly, I'd say, in my view, rebuilding trust is a guiding principle that we should have as politics, that regulation, measurement, surveillance is not the way to do it. By the way, we have one camera for every 12 people in the UK on surveillance, which just seems quite a lot to me, um, rather than trust is how you breed trust. And ultimately, if you trust someone, that's the only way to trust. Uh, if I've got time, have I got time? No, no, in that case, I will do, we can talk about in policy implications later on in that case. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Paul, that was very useful, and also it was quite a nice way to finish off, you know, build trust by trusting, which, to a certain extent, is the answer, in my opinion. So we could all go home now. But, uh, <laughs> but um, there is something profoundly true about that, and yet, what is, how do you make that a reality? Um, so anyway, Jill, your thoughts, please. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm just going to do a little sort of canter through a bit of history of trust, because I think people here are all sort of suggesting there was a sort of golden age of trusting. Um, I'm not so convinced that there was. Uh, and then I'm going to suggest that actually we're at a bit of a crossroads now, and there are two ways this might go, and I think one way is easier than the other. Um, so five ages of trust. When I joined the civil service, which was, uh, as Claire's vaguely hinted, rather a long time ago, we operated on the principle, even internally, of a sort of need-to-know principle. I mean, this is what you might describe as a sort of Downton Abbey uh, approach to public services, which was basically you were grateful for what you got. Uh, it was probably quite local, so you probably had some sort of relationship with your local service. Uh, it was a bit grim. Uh, there was an attitude of deference and uh, deference towards the providers. That might have been counter countered to an extent by a public sector ethos, which was still there, but actually there was a counter to that, which was extreme producer capture. Basically, um, a bit 
even before that. When I went to school, the idea was if you went to a bad school and you did bad at school, it's because you were thick. It was nothing really to do with the school. So actually, that was you were just grateful for the crumbs that were spread from the tables. So that's your need to know thing. Then we had Mrs. Thatcher bounced in, and we had what we might uh, might call the sort of Thatcher major uh, privatisation under Mrs. Thatcher of some of the sort of non-core activities under John Major, beginning to think actually, well, don't the people that people are doing services for matter to an extent. So you had things like the Citizens' Charter. You started to have league tables telling you, very controversial at the time, telling you and actually admitting that there were slight differentials in performance. Yeah. So that was a bit of a revolution. It wasn't just a sort of lump and service or whatever. Uh, with that then came various sort of measures to try and drive that up, a bit of inspection, a bit of this, a bit of that. Anyway, that was a bit of shopping around sort of Esther Ranson culture around public services. Then we had Blair Brown and... Their counterpart for putting a lot of money into public services was what I've called the money for something approach to public services. So basically they said, well, okay, we're going to put quite a lot of money in uh, after the first two years, but we need to know that we're getting something out. And the way in which they expressed that was this absolute plethora of targets, indicators and outcomes. At one stage, government, central government had 1,100 indicators of how local government, dem democratically elected local government should perform, because actually they didn't think the basic mechanisms of local democracy worked. So you've got a lot of money going in, but then you've got the sort of Barbarite sort of views of deliverology, but part of the counterpart of that was gaming and infantilization of people who were working in those. They were chasing not the real outcome, but they were chasing these individual target outcomes. At the same time, the other thing you got on going on in the public sector was what I've called the sort of because I'm worth it culture. Um, you had this extreme takeoff of salaries, particularly in London, globalization with the financial service and people in the public sector increasingly feeling, well, I need to get a bit of a share of that. Uh, there was quite a lot of money to go around. So you got people being prepared to pay themselves salaries in the public sector or to indulge in some practices in bits of the public sector that were very difficult to justify to the pensioner whose taxpayers' money you were spending in the dog and duck. We then have the new age. We have what Oliver Letwin referred to as TripAdvisor government, and you might actually say Margaret Hodge has sort of appointed herself in TripAdvisor government as a sort of super reviewer on behalf of the citizen. Uh, I'm on TripAdvisor. I'm called Pansy McLean on TripAdvisor if you want to read my reviews. But uh, anyway, so <laughs> Margaret Hodge is the Pansy McLean of, uh, of this government, reviewing around and seeking out all things that are bad. And the problem we found is that with transparency, which I think is the genie let out, which isn't going to go back into the bottle, we actually can really not focus on the big, difficult to measure outcomes. We focus on some quite trivial things like salaries, like where did you hold that training conference? Was it in quite a nice five-star hotel? And actually, those are all things that are sort of due to come out because we had that time when people thought there's quite a lot of money going around. We might as well spend it on ourselves. But I think there's a real danger now. Uh, and I think... We're now entering a fifth age when there are two ways to go. One of which is you could have extreme alienation from the public sector, from public services. So you see that in sort of mid-staffs, you get a cycle of exposure, everybody agreeing that was a really bad thing to happen. You can't really pay very good people anymore because you're clamping down on salaries. Now I've got this alleged ceiling of not paying more than the prime minister. Uh, you're not allowed to do things that might make places <coughs> decent places to work, like going on a training conference in a relatively nice place. You over-regulate at every turn to avoid all scandals. And basically, the danger, if you go that way, is that the public sector becomes the refuge of people with no alternatives, both the people working there, but also the people using those services. The alternative uh, is that actually you trust some of the leaders of public institutions to actually be prepared to recognize and accept failure. There was a very interesting session yesterday on doctors where they all, I thought, avoided the question on mid-staffs and how that could happen in a health service uh, with extreme alacrity. There's got to be space in public debate for people to be allowed to accept that sometimes things go wrong. And actually it isn't, you know, the real answer you want is how people respond. Quite interesting people on TripAdvisor say the thing they look for is not the reviews, which are all spacey Americans who don't like sort of European standard of service, but how the people respond to that. Um, you need some user engagement, involvement, preparedness to validate. You need a willingness to reward and recognize, not necessarily performance-related pay, but a willingness to recognize who's doing a good job. But you 
in particular need to be able to recognise responsible failures and you need to build some trust that the people in charge of institutions are prepared to react and actually are interested in offering a better service. At the moment, I think we're sort of poised quite dangerously between those two. I think the easier instinct is to go for what on my slides is the left-hand side of that, to go to the alienation model of constantly more regulation. I think the big question is, is the leadership of our public institutions up to the second side of going for rediscovering and rebuilding? And I'm not sure we are yet. OK, thank you. Thank you. That was excellent, Jill. Um, both the TripAdvisor notion, but also I think those two alternatives at the end are, are important for us to consider and maybe we can dig deeper into in the discussion. So, um, Victor, your thoughts? And I'll leave the mic over. Well, um, we had a bit of a debate before about who should go at this point, and I wanted it to be me because I hadn't prepared such fantastic arguments. Um, so I hadn't really thought, I hadn't really thought about what I thought about this. I think it's a very difficult, difficult subject but the following things come to mind the first is um, if someone does come at you with a gun my advice as a member of the house and law of lords and a kind of semi-politician is, is don't don't go for them don't don't have a go all right that's sensible that's not because it's nanny state that's that's sensible my other point is that trust is an emotion it's you trust somebody emotionally it's not something it's, it's head and heart uh, that produces something. It's not something that can be manufactured. Although uh, the fact that we had such a credit boom and the banks were doing so well is precisely be because they did manufacture trust. They manufactured trust and lots of people trusted them. And um, we're now in a massive economic crisis partly as a, as a result, to be honest. And indeed, the same can be said for politicians. My view would be that in a democracy, you uh, as citizens have a duty to be sceptical. I actually think that what we're talking about is precisely what we should be talking about. It worries me, and it always has worried me, um, that people had total trust in the police. I remember when Lawrence, um, when the Stephen Lawrence case occurred, um, members of both the left and the right uh, political parties, I'm, I'm a crossbencher, a member of no party, so I slag them all off, but they, they, people were sort of willing to believe that the Lawrence family were completely and utterly at fault. That he, they must, he must have done something. He must, A, because he was black, and B, because it's the police, and the police can't be wrong. And that happens thousands of times, millions of times, generally not to middle-class intelligent people, but to everyone else. Those people don't trust. They haven't trusted for decades, to be honest. Um, so I actually think that, A, you shouldn't trust your leaders. Why the hell should you, actually? Um, the reason why there's regulation, in fact, the reason why there were targets, is because those yeah. leaders felt that they could get your trust yeah. by putting in place, yeah. responding, actually, to an unintelligent yeah. blur from yeah. the masses that was kind of, I don't want my kids to end up like yeah. that. I don't want to go into hospital. So the response is, we don't expect our leaders to be honest. We don't expect our institutions to learn. And then we blame them when they do exactly the opposite. They lie and they're not honest. So I think the position that we've got with our institutions is almost a blinding glimpse of the obvious. I think it's a good thing. A lot of the things that have, that have occurred in regard to the police and the NHS have occurred because of the mass availability of technology, um, not least to the, not just to the middle classes, actually, but to the poor, the people who can now afford to tweet and tell people and put up um, messages that such and such isn't working. If you want to know why mid-staffs happened, it's because they were ignored, actually. The evidence was there. It was actually on the posters in the cafe across the road from the hospital. It was on the Twitter pages, but the institutions ignored them. Why? Because it didn't think that their trust was necessary. It didn't, tr it didn't think that actually they should be, the institution should be open to trust. It should be p completely pervious to a questioning, sceptical public. And I think taxpayers um, rid themselves of a key and core duty when they cease to be sceptical. I note that um, 
you know, in London, we have a, and I'm going to use this word multiculturalism, and it's just a shortcut, because it's a bit like coffee. You know, you can't unmix it. London is multicultural, because that's what it is. But I note that um, in many of our institutions, the representation of those citizens is lacking. We have a monoculture pr pr pretty much running the institutions. And then we're shocked when the people who aren't represented, whose voices aren't heard, whose consumer needs aren't delivered, don't trust those, those institutions. Well, you need to change the leadership, absolutely. You need to demand, actually, that those institutions produce what they could produce in, in, the, in terms of public services, which are bespoke responses. I think the technology, the understanding, the deliverability is, perf is there. It's one of the reasons why some of our technology companies are doing so well. They do invent things with their consumers. You know? And that's what public services need to do. So, if I was going to uh, conclude then, I'm sorry it's not been as beautifully uh, expressed, but frankly, you get the public services that you ask for, and one of the problems that we've had, and I've, I, one of the worst things I ever heard a politi politician say two things to me. And I, the, the first is that uh, when they were, they were talking about the NHS, and I said, why are you doing this transformation? People don't understand it. What is it about? And the response was, you know what? People don't understand the NHS. We can do what we like. That was that's true. And the second thing, worst thing I've ever heard from a politician, <laughs> well, he was actually from a public policy leader, was um, when we were talking about public service reform, something which I feel passionate about, the response was, you know what, my job is to make things simple for the people. What an insulting thing to say. Actually, your job is to introduce complexity, the kind of complexity that you, every single person in this hall, has to live with, and to engage in a discussion about what that means for the transparency, the total transparency, of the public services that you pay for. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that was also a proper challenge, even to the premise of the session, you know. Yeah. Good job that we don't trust them. Um, so we'll come back on a lot of that. Thank you very much, Victor. Finally, Alex. Uh, thanks, Claire. I want to do three things. I want to continue Victor's questioning of the premise that uh, distrust of institutions is necessarily bad. I think pretty often it's good. Uh, secondly, I want to talk about, a pre you can have a preference in this kind of session and this kind of society, rules or reality, and increasingly those things are being separated out. And thirdly, I want to talk briefly about whistleblowers. Um, and their place in society in a, in a realm of public trust or distrust. So first of all, um, I think it's very good, frequently, as Victor's been setting out, to be sceptical of institutions. And I think that our institutions, I'm, I'm quite a sceptical person, I think it's good to be challenging and sceptical in a robustly, constructively critical way um, of government. I think that in the past, our uh, blind obedience or blindish obedience to institutions has done us as a society harm. Um, we talked about Mid-Staffordshire, um, almost every speaker's uh, mentioned that. I, I think of Hillsborough. You know, the police mm -hmm. and unchallenged um, accounts said that uh, people at Hillsborough had robbed the dead and had urinated on the police. Lies. Mm -hmm. You know, lies that went unchallenged for decades, um, at least by those in authority. And it took a groundswell uh, of opinion um, to try to dig the truth uh, out of that. So questioning uh, the premise that distrust of institutions is necessarily bad is the first thing that I want to... I say, but that's, I mean, that's also to do with the fact that I, I suppose I'm now part of an institution elected in um, the City of London, and I have here in my hand a copy of In Defence of the City, uh, which I uh, turned out five copies for anyone that would like them, and for the questioning millions watching us on, uh, on TV later, you can get some um, from the Freedom Association's website. But the thing about that is that there are two kinds of um, trust or distrust that you can have about institutions. The one that matters is this challenging and questioning of what an institution does in your name to individuals, what, which we've always got to have. And then there's the one that doesn't really matter, the sort of conspiracy theory, I reckon they're always out to get us, which frankly I think institutions have just got to live with and you've just got to wear and put up with. It's part of the warp and weft of being a, uh, an institution that has power and money that people question what you are. So, you know, he, the City of London, which runs, of course, this very building that we're sitting in, the Barbican Centre, the library upstairs, the Museum of London next door. Uh, it's a, a major local authority and philanthropic body. And, and when I got elected two years ago, all my mates said, what's that? Is that something to do with the Masons? You know, there's all that innate sort of suspicion. And that's just tough luck. If people don't know about it, it's up to you to explain it. And that sort of distrust doesn't matter. 
Equally, the Rotary, uh, just, I'm just looking at examples that occur to me. The Rotary Club, one of the world's biggest philanthropic organisations. When I got a scholarship from the Rotary Club, people said, what's that? Is that something to do with the Masons? <laughs> um, you know, and I joined my livery company, which is a, a series of livery companies in London, Absolutely. which reach back, reach back to ancient craft, older and more traditional and more established than almost anything else in the United Kingdom. When I joined the livery company to do good and charitable deeds, people said to me, what's that? Is that something to do with the Masons? <laughs> you know, so, you know, that sort of distrust, it doesn't really matter. And we mustn't let the sort of conspiracy theory bounces off the surface distrust interfere, which we all kind of laugh at and dismiss, interfere with the real distrust, the constructive um, criticism of those in power, which I think is a good thing. Um, secondly, rules or reality. Um, we are increasingly in a society where those responsible for um, running rules or inflicting rules on us prefer those rules to the reality of the situation they're policing. Our f high-fiving lollipop man was taken off the street that he liked to, that he was employed to take out his lollipop stick and, um, and stop traffic, and in his place there was nothing. Those who administered the rules, who said you're not allowed to high-five the children as they go over the streets, preferred that street to be unmanned because that, that was at least adhered to the rules, then they preferred for the lollipop man to be there, but to be high-fiving children. That's a, when you get to that point, when you prefer your rules to the reality of the individuals, the lives of the individuals affected by those rules, um, you're living in a crazy society. And to choose a, an even more provocative example, Catholic adoption agencies in this country were placing hundreds of children in loving homes. But rather than having that happen, those who administered the rules over adoption said... Is, as long as you've got this position about homosexuality, you can't place children uh, in, in any homes at all. And asked, would you rather those children stayed in care homes then? The frank answer was yes. We'd rather not have people um, taking part in this scheme, even though the reality of their lives may be immeasurably worse. When you prefer your dogged rules to the reality uh, uh, of the, the lives being affected by your imposition of those rules, it's right that we challenge you, and it's right that we don't trust you. And in fact, it's wor worse than that, it's right that we try to get the situation changed. Thirdly, and briefly, um, throughout all of that, I think we've got to, and this is where Brenda and I may, may disagree a bit, because I think that sometimes encouraging whistleblowers is a good thing. I think that, um, I think that enabling individuals to speak out, it flows necessarily from what I've said, doesn't it? N enabling people to speak out about the um, falsity or the wrongness of the systems in which they are themselves acting, normally uh, anonymously, because they fear for their own income or their own positions uh, or their own, uh, their own livelihoods, that's a good thing. And if you need to have um, anonymity online to, uh, to enable people to do that, and Twitter and online forums are the best as long as we don't intrude into privacy online more than, um, more than we are now, and we're already trying to remove anonymity online in some important and, un and worrying ways, as long as we can protect people's ability to speak out, then you're going to improve systems because systems deserve to be robustly tested. Sometimes individuals will make false challenges, or well, you should investigate those and prove that they're false. That's the necessary cost of being accountable in any democratic society. But sometimes, how do we find out about the Southern Cross abuse? A whistleblower. How do people know about what's happening, oftentimes, to the elderly in the NHS? It comes from a whistleblower. You know, we've got to enable people and allow people to speak out against the systems in which they themselves live and work. And one of the biggest risks that I think uh, we face as a society in attempts to basically undermine and remove privacy is that it's that very privacy that protects people's ability to challenge the authority I've been talking about today. Those are my three points. Thank you. Very good. Very interesting, Alex. And it, I'm just going to start by going over actually to Paul and Jill and then back to Brennan because we heard him quite a long time ago. But Paul and Jill, just, just following on from that, I suppose and your rules thing, and just on the whistleblower question. See, one of the things that I've been slightly nervous about is this sort of, like, free whistleblowing lines put up in hospitals, anonymous whistleblowers. And the reason I'm saying it is, you know, this idea of attracting good people, Jill. Um, and it's part of my... I'm slightly obsessed with the transparency agenda, which I think has gone far too far. Um, it's this idea that, that it seems unlikely to me that you're going to be able to create a trust in atmosphere at work if you keep thinking everyone's going to snitch on you. And it's, it's almost like the kind of transparency agenda where everyone feels that they have to speak as though they're on record at all time. And I think part of leadership of an institution, any institution, is you have the capacity to close the door and speak frankly and decide, you know, and say the, 
unthinkable in order to work out what it feels like. Whereas the, the, the transparency agenda almost makes everybody kind of walk around speaking as though they're, you know, very ploddy. And it's not very creative, not very imaginative. And then you're worried about leaks and then you're worried about whistleblowers. Sometimes these things which appear to be solving the problem can make it worse. Or am I making that up? Well, I think one of the things we've got a problem with is that we can't distinguish between sort of, you know, reasonable failures and really bad failures. Because actually what you want in an institution is you want people to be able to say, I don't think we did as good a job as we could have done mm. there. And actually for people higher up to say, yes, you're right, we didn't do as good. Let's think about what we do about it. And actually if you do that, that's good. That becomes a sort of self-improving organisation. When you get whistleblowers, I mean, it's quite interesting listening to Lisa Martin on the radio yesterday saying, I went to my manager when they overdosed this woman with warfarin. Warfarin's quite difficult. My mother takes warfarin all the time. Uh, you have to be very careful about what you take. So, you know, you could have said, oh, my God, what have we done? What do we do? We need to ring up instantly. We need to do this and things like that. But the sort of institution is, well, we've got to cover this up because okay. actually no one will, get, will say, oh, my God, they made a mistake, but actually, yeah. Yeah. you know, they generally provide quite a good service. That was a one-off error, and they'll put in self-correcting mechanisms. So I think it's a really interesting thing about why do you get to the position where people's only resort is to go public, wreck their careers, you know, become sort of um, shunned by all their colleagues. And I think you need to say what's going on in the institutions, that that's the way you have to go, as opposed to saying... Oh my God, we got that a bit wrong, didn't we? Can we do that? Because you're going to make mistakes. It's because we don't have a situation where people are allowed to admit legitimate mistakes and think that actually people are going to try and do it, do it better. And I think that's where you need to get into. So I think you need to accompany transparency, this is going to sound a bit wimpy, with a bit sort of understanding that, you know, if you're prepared to be transparent about things you've done wrong, actually you've got a bit of space to solve them before you're instantly sacked, coruscated, you know, have no career anymore. If you only offer people those choices, you're a real problem. Paul? Um, I, I was just going back to the Victor thing and answering your question. I, I think Victor's exactly right. We are in a new world where um, now measurement transparency is out there, and that means we are inherently going to be less trusting and that is probably a good thing, as long as what we should be looking at is not what used to be, which was blind trust, mm. into active trust. And I think public sector in particular, in, in the way it behaves, should still think about trust as being the guiding principle, because it implies both the intention to do something correctly and the capability that they are doing it properly. So I think active trust from, from people means that they, uh, if you like, have transparent data to do it, and that is still a measure for the public sector. On your question, where, where I, I, I think it is important is that there are mechanisms where things can be challenged. We're absolutely mm. clear how we can see, how we can measure and do it. That is not the same as going to the extremes that Brendan was worried about at the beginning, which is when you have active posters up there encouraging whistleblowers and active posters um, disintegrating trust. And so I think any public institution needs to think about has it crossed that line between being open, transparent, and welcoming feedback when things are underperforming to actively suggesting the world is crap. Hmm. Were you going to say something then, Jim? I was no. just going to say, I went to the two sessions on doctors and the police yesterday, and there was two words that were in common in both sessions, which they said both those professions were currently characterised by fear and secrecy internally. I thought that was quite worrying. Uh, Brendan and then Victor, and then, yeah. and um, then I'm going out in there. Yeah, I think... I'd there's an element of phony radicalism, I think, to some of these arguments, because I think if you, it does matter, actually, that people are less trusting of institutions. And that doesn't mean that I want people to have blind trust in institutions or blind faith, but I think it does speak to cynicism rather than scepticism. Scepticism is, is a good thing. It's critical-minded, it's open, it's open to being convinced, it's engaging. That's good. Cynicism, which I think goes in hand in hand with today's climate of mistrust, is the opposite of that. It's defeatist. It's not open to being convinced. It's a natural uh, inclination to believe that people are suspect and dodgy and not out for the uh, common good. It's a very different thing entirely. And, you know, I, I agree with Victor when he says that, you, you know, you shouldn't have blind trust in our leaders. Of course, you shouldn't automatically trust people. But... Today, there are other forms of blind faith that people often don't seem to criticise. So, for example, Victor raises the uh, example of the police and people trusting the police over the Lawrences. But now, today, in this period, there is blind trust in the Lawrence campaign. 
and there is blind faith in Doreen Lawrence in particular, who's been elevated to this saintly status. And let's look at one of the consequences of that. The, one of the key consequences of that has been the demolition of the double jeopardy rule, something that existed for hundreds and hundreds of years, which guarded people against being harassed by the state and tried twice for the same crime. That's now gone as a result of politicians' exploitation of blind trust in the Lawrence campaign. So if we're going to be open, if we're going to be genuinely critically engaged, I think we need to be questioning of all forms of authority, not just the old-fashioned ones that we can all agree are a bit outdated and, and, and weird. But I think uh, the key thing for me is that this climate of mistrust is a problem. It's a problem because it's driven by, I think, cynicism rather than skeptical engagement. And it's primarily a problem because it impacts on people's real lives every day. If people can't trust their workmates, that workplace is going to be a horrible place. If children are encouraged not to trust their own parents, that's going to have a detrimental impact on the family home. If patients don't trust their doctors and doctors don't trust their patients, that relationship is going to break down. It's very easy for people in positions of authority to say, oh, mistrust is fine. It's, in fact, it's a good thing. In the real world, that development of cynicism, which is a top-down project, is having a really detrimental impact on how people experience life and their solidarity with each other. Uh, Victor. Um, well... I mean, that was very dramatic. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think there's two things. If you want to know why um, the, the woman who, who um, whistle blew in the elderly home uh, got the response that she did, both from the home and was nervous, it's because she was not pointing out a tactical error. She was pointing out a strategic one. Mm. Let me explain. There's a big difference between you going into an elderly home and saying to someone you know what, that old lady's crying, she needs a handkerchief, she needs something to put an arm around her, and somebody going, absolutely, you're right. You know why they're doing that? They're doing that because the strategy of that organisation and the underpinning structures allow that to happen, right? The funding structures, the way it's organised, allow that interaction between you and that staff member to happen and that old lady to get what she needs. In this case, the opposite was the case. The reason why she didn't get the response from the manager that she should have got was because the structures, the strategy, the incentives were designed to do exactly the opposite. And that is where the fear comes in. That's where you got the cover-up. So I think we just need to understand how these things happen. On, on the point of... of, of uh, and it's just a, it's the very point. I can, it'd be really good if, we, if we're having this conversation not to just talk about the public sector. <coughs> when people talk about the public sector, I always have this image of lime green walls and no choice. I have a bigger question, which is what is the public sector in this day and age? We've, uh, we've had a, a banking crisis, the likes of which we've not seen before. You know, some people have called it the biggest robbery in the history of Western capitalism. It was an inside job and they've got away with it. And, and the fact of the matter is, was that a public service? The, the blurring of lines between what is public, private and not-for-profit is also part of this debate. And I just think it's important that we actually understand that because the future lies actually in the recreation of some of our services to the public from the ground up with the public as opposed to against them, which is one of the reasons why you've got some of these uh, challenges in health and social care in the first place. Uh, Alex, directly, but pick up anything, sure. and then I'm going out to the audience. But directly, I suppose, just um, the provocative point made by Brendan about the yeah. Doreen Lawrence campaign. But I suppose, I, and I've written about my concern about the kind of whistleblower as the new hero. So I've always wanted a kind of... I mean, I've always had the romantic ideal of the whistleblower going, you know, obviously everyone has, and yeah. it's brave, and they've jeopardised their jobs and so on. But it's something about this kind of, like duty to report almost that's going on. I mean, Hunt actually made that point about the NHS. It's almost like, you know, you've got to report everything, you've got to phone everyone up. And it, it's, it's, it's a bit, it, you, you do feel as though it's like a bit like East Europe, you know, there's, there's something of the kind of sure. spy on your neighbour and can you make sure they're not hitting the elderly, doing this, doing it. Yeah. And, and, I, and I, if you actually criticise the whistleblower, then everybody goes, you're on the side of big business, covering up corporates, government, all that. And I, uh, that yeah. makes me nervous. Well, look, I'm against people who whistleblow falsely, obviously, in the same way that I'm against anyone who alleges a crime falsely. 
You know, we have all these... The, part of the debate about the way we enforce rape laws in this country is driven by the supposed fact that people make lots of false allegations, to which my answer is, well, prosecute them then, rather than seeking to um, evade the, the, the fact that we um, have a crime called rape in this country. It, equally, I'm sceptical, not cynical, I'm sceptical over the new ways of investigating things uh, that we have in this country, as well as the old ones. I, I find it deeply troubling that the first instinct of government is also to find, um, put a problem in the last refuge of the scoundrel, which is a judge-led inquiry, and say, oh, well, we're going to get feedback and lessons will be learned. Uh, and meanwhile, you've used these rules, to repeat my idea, you've used these rules over time and producing a big report and you know, stroking your beard and saying we've thought about this seriously, to distance yourself from the reality, mm. which was an old woman left in her own mess in a bed all day, night, all day day and all night with her breakfast and her lunch piling up next to her with the person putting them there not caring whether she ate them or not you know mm -hmm. when you get that far from the reality and you're just interested in the rules that you're you're seeking to input then of course I, I'm, I'm skeptical of them but the, the whistleblower has a real place in that discussion because the whistleblower can start that ball rolling and but if the whistleblower makes that allegation um, wrongly I'm afraid that's part of what the cost we have to bear we may wind up investigating things that turn out not to be true I would rather do that and I would rather institutions had to put up with false allegations oh well which I think is just part of the warp and weft of life than stopping people from complaining in the first place which I think is far more dangerous okay throw it out to the audience I do want to just throw in Leveson has not been mentioned and is very core. Cool. And also, I want to call on you to consider Paul's point, which is, is that we restore trust by trusting, which rather than kind of tick box re regime, you know, which uh, uh, I just wanted a quote from the blurb, bureaucratic exercises, and it says, one doctor lamented every box ticked is a kindness lost. But it does strike me, you know, restore trust by following these rules can just mean that you get... Um, yes, you can see what I'm saying. Anyway, OK, fine. You uh, just picking up on something Victor said at the end uh, about what is a public service these days, how much do you think that a private business which relies on the trust of its customers, that's fundamental to it being successful, is different to a public institution which is funded through taxes? And how far did the banks step from one to the other they don't rely on being trusted anymore because they know they can be bailed out. I think it was Victor that said that um, we say that we get, that we get uh, a service that we ask for. So when we say that we get the service that we ask for, but we continue to mistrust the institutions, how can we expect to get the service that we deserve? I work in a university and um, since the start of term a couple of weeks ago we've had posters appearing everywhere and on the front page of the university website it says are you facing discrimination or do you know someone who is <laughs> don't suffer in silence speak out report incidents anonymously at and then it gives a link for you to click on for the website and I think Generation this is Generation. really disastrous um, for four reasons. Um, it makes you think that there is discrimination taking place everywhere. It makes you really suspicious of everybody else. It makes you think that people can't deal with what's going on themselves. It makes you think that if they are suffering from discrimination, they can't report it themselves, that they need somebody else to report it for them. Um, and it also makes you think that if you do report something, you will have disastrous consequences falling upon you. I think particularly for education, where so much of education is based upon trust, I need my students to trust me because I'm going to really push them beyond their comfort zone in the, in the seminar room. Um, but I also need to trust my students that I'm going to be able to speak frankly and push them without them reporting me for a slight breach of saying something not politically correct. I think to um, go back to, I think, one of the points that Victor was making, um, the, the, what this campaign is asking people to do is to report incidents of discrimination to the Human Resources Department. Now, the people I would actually trust least in my university are the Human Resources Department, and that's who we're all being asked to place our trust in rather than each other, so it undermines the trust that we have in ourselves, and it, it pushes us into um, placing HR on some kind of pedestal. I think there's a failure of historical memory here. I think people were always sceptical of the state, but they organised in different ways. When there were powerful mm. trade unions and community groups, mm. the state was kept in check. Mm. The state always had um, contempt for the masses. If you look at it historically, it's very obvious. Mm. But they were fearful as well. You know, with the self-collapse, internal collapse of trade unions <coughs> and other political organisations, 
you know, we can date that to 1989, mm. there's nothing left but sheer open contempt for individuals. Mm. Yeah. And, mm. you know, like uh, the last speaker, I work in universities, and there's no reason, no scandals that I know of, why you shouldn't trust people in education. But education is ridden with mistrust of teacher yeah. and a pupil. And just to give an example of something that I think is something you could tackle is the contracting culture. Now, I have a, a, a seminars with PhD students, and you know, I'm supposed at the end to them to sign an, a statement about everything we've done and agree it. Now, you can't run, and that happens throughout education. You can't, I used to do that with people who had learning difficulties and were badly behaved. Right? Mm. You contract it. So that is really the attitude to everybody now. You can't trust anybody. It hasn't ha yet happened, but I suspect that degree of mistrust will come to marriages. You know, if you want to have a good marriage, have a contractual relationship about how you're going to relate to one another, and you know your marriage is doomed. In the same way, the culture of mistrust, which has nothing to keep it in check, means that we, we are forced to be in these contractual relationships. And I think one method you could do is just abandon some of these things. A very positive thing is stop contracting. And the campaign that was held by the Manifesto Club against um, um, the... Um, CRB checks, which have absolutely no purpose and no function, but they, everybody goes along with them. And there is a, a scope for individuals to actually take some action against these things and make a little stand in your workplace. Because you can't work with people who you only have a contractual relationship with, you have to trust. I think that's really um, when, Jill, you were giving us the alternatives, because I think it's the regulation, but it is the contractual interpersonal relationships in workplaces don't, that I do think will kill us off altogether. Don't confuse contracting with contract. Okay, well you can explain that in but a minute. There are two different things. I was just thinking of public space and um, I went to uh, see the cinema at Brixton the, the other day and was confronted in this beautiful public space that's been created at uh, Brixton with a big, well I don't know if it was a sculpture or something, but it was massive and it had this kind of little girl looking up it was all a kind of big spot, big circle, looking up, this woman who was sort of looking away, and in the middle of the big white uh, circle, it said, stop. Uh, thankfully, I've got better things to do, but I was <laughs> thinking about at night you know, and putting something on there. Yeah. But it did make me think, and I stopped, and I asked people, and I said, what is that all about? And, I mean, what was interesting and, and positive <coughs> is that the people I spoke to didn't say, oh, yeah, it's not me, I wouldn't do anything bad to children, but there are, there are out there. They actually said, I mean, it's meaningless, you know, it's, I don't know why it's there, it's stupid, isn't it? It's really insulting. That was the progressive thing. But I, I, I would agree with Brendan about what wasn't so progressive um, is that there's total adrift between they don't understand us. So actually that has no, no, no meaning to us at all. So totally, the, the institutions, and, the, and, and, and I, I hear it in the weekend, we call them elites or something like that, but those in power, um, are totally adrift from the normal public. And I think that is a worry. The other th example it shows is that it was, a, it was an example of the hideous NSPCC uh, adverts that uh, keep on telling us to uh, not trust ourselves and uh, children shouldn't trust themselves. So when talking about the charity sector, Actually, they, they, they can expect, they're supposed to be independent of government, and yet they're the ones that really do like ticking the boxes and telling um, us who work with uh, youngsters that we shouldn't trust uh, ourselves. I think there's a concern and a conflation around what is trust? You know, if we're trying to build trust, how to build trust, uh, you've got to define it. And I'm surprised that certain words, perhaps old-fashioned words, haven't been used, like honour, service and loyalty. You know, we haven't used those. How can you talk about trust without talking in those terms? I find it amazing that we spent three quarters of an hour and we haven't mentioned these terms, which when you trusted someone historically, say a handshake on a contract, you know, you're trusting someone to do something for you or you're paying someone to do something, you seal it with a handshake. It had that sense of honor, you know, you honored that person and respect and service and loyalty. So where is that in this discussion? Where is that in this discussion? What seems to have taken over are things like, we've got to design around the customer. We've got to be viable now. You know, we don't do anything unless it's viable. We've got to be transparent. Public reform uh, is all about being transparency. Well, all those things are about now, a sort of sense of the present. What about planning for the future? And I did like Paul's 
uh, sense of let's tr have trust as a guiding principle, but let's also get, put some meat into it and put some meat into what trust is. Maybe honour and service and loyalty are a bit old-fashioned concepts, and we need modern versions of them, but they did build the city. They did build its NHS. They did build these institutions, and they're now disintegrating around us. We're talking about trust of institutions against the public or trust of the public to the institutions, but what happens within an institution? What happens when things strategically fail? And why are we only talking about the whistleblower being the solution or not being the solution? How do you, if you're a civil servant, if you're a university lecturer, you discover something in your institution and you want to do something about it, how do you go and do it without just resigning? Paul, uh, I'll just pick up on, on one of the earlier questions, but there was a question about, you know, what about, we've talked about the public sector, what about the private sector? What should they be doing about trust? Um, absolutely key, trust isn't just a public sector thing. It is across... Um, society and the private sector is seen to be as broken as the public given over the credit crunch in fact it was the private sector cock-ups that caused the credit crunch and the subsequent austerity not the public sector so I think the private sector companies have to really be thinking about themselves long and hard now in particular thinking about determining what is their social purpose and I think more and more you will find companies in the next 10 years are going to get measured not just on their sort of annual accounts and their profit and loss accounts, but what's their contribution to society, what's their social purpose, what's their carbon footprint, and that will be a growing theme. What's interesting is, um, I mean, I, my own belief is they should be doing that because it is the right Ooh. thing to do. Ooh. However, um, actually, for some, they'll do it for, for profit reasons because there are growing surveys that customers are more and more buying because of they like the social values <laughs> and the underlying carbon footprint and other things in a product rather than the product itself. Mm -hmm. So if customers are switching that way, companies will go anyway, but I think they should be doing it because it's the right thing to do, not for other reasons. Mm. Okay, thanks. Jill, anything you want to pick up? Yeah, I want to pick up a bit of, about the point of contracting. I'm, I think there's a really interesting thing about designing internal systems, which meet your point about, actually, what do I do if I want to get things a bit better, but I don't want to go, go public, ditch all my colleagues and stuff like that. So I think it's a really interesting thing about, do you have leadership institutions who can actually articulate what good and better look like? Um, so you look at real outcome, met, real outcome service measures, not just, you know, conforming to some targets. And can you actually design internal processes and cultures that actually can give people what I think is quite important, which is confidence in institutions, that actually you don't have to go to this resort of imposing loads of rules because you're confident that the institution actually is trying to do its best and will respond to its mistakes and failures. There's a really good book by um, <coughs> a surgeon called Atul Gawande called Better, uh, where he has some really interesting examples of ways in which bits of the medical profession have sort of responded to some of those sort of incentives as well, but other bits have just not a self not a learning profession at all. I think it's a really interesting challenge to people in public institutions of can they can they invent that route and do they have the leadership to do it? Victor. Very much agree with what Jill said. I think I just think that contracting is a process like trust. Nobody trusts instantly. And uh, the gentleman that talked about the language, my belief is that the language has changed. But m perhaps we should use simpler language because it has more resonance mm -hmm. with people who don't come to these events on a Sunday morning. Uh, but but I do think that that um, it is possible to build trust. And, and it, but you have to build it. It's not instant. It has to be earned. I, I was struck, uh, if I may, uh, by the young lady, the woman who was talking about um, the discrimination notice. And, and I'm going to say some things that probably won't make me very popular uh, with the educationalist amongst you, because the, what you were saying, I was sitting here thinking, so, um, well... Uh, perhaps, uh, I'd certainly agree with you that reporting to HR might be a problem, um, <laughs> but certainly reporting to you shouldn't be. Then the question struck me, well, do you discriminate? I don't know. I mean, you say you don't, but I don't know. And uh, the experience of discrimination, um, is that possible to discuss that with you in a way that actually leaves someone with a sense that they've been heard, particularly if they don't look or come from the same class background as you? Or How is that, how is that done? So some of these reactions to the fear uh, that people have of speaking up about discrimination. And believe me, there is fear in most institutions, particularly the, one of the ways discrimination works is that it puts the fear of God into the discriminated against, which is why they don't say anything, um, is why you get these notices. So while I can see the frustration, the notice, 
and the idea of, of, the, of HR, I think it does beg a genuine question. Either your institution doesn't have discrimination at all, which frankly I don't believe, or that you have a way of dealing with discrimination which actually the people who, who are discriminated against generally in society believe in, i.e. they trust. Thanks. Alex, uh, it briefly, it, it, taking in a few questions, we were challenged what, you know, what is trust and a few of the different words we ought to think about. Let me answer it in the way you didn't mean me to answer, but tr uh, indirectly, trust is something you have to earn very often. Uh, you know, so in defence of the city says what we try to do and it, it encapsulates the values you were talking about, honour and so forth. Now, when I was saying that institutions have to live with suspicion and have to take brickbats and so forth, it doesn't mean you just ignore it. You have to constantly make... I would say this, wouldn't I, work in public relations? Weber Shanwick, the best public relations firm in the world. Um, but, you know, I would, I would say that. But you have to con constantly make your case. But there comes a, a point where that case, your PR can only go so far, and your performance is what determines whether you're trusted or not. The hard reality of what you do, and that's why to the second question, I think that um, the system as a whole meant we don't no longer trust banks in anything like the same way, because we should have let Northern Rock go to the wall, we should have let them fail, and instead we propped them up. So now none of them trust the system, because we thought we were playing game A, that's what all the kit was for, that's what the goalposts were for, and it turns out that those who were refereeing the game had in their mind silent game be um, and you know changed all of the rules so problem. I as a good sort of capitalist anarchist get told people well isn't this your system don't you like capitalism I say well I'd rather like some instead we've got corporatism um, so moving uh, moving across on CRB checks actually it was the gentleman up there in the city we tried I say we the, the officers of the city tried to gold plate um, CRB checks, that is to say, if you moved between um, authority roles, say from a school to um, a hospital or an orchestra or something, you would have to be re-CRB checked, even though you had a valid CRB from the same authority. Was it required by law? No, it was not. Why were we doing it? Good practice. It was good practice. Who's going to pay? Oh, the school or the hospital. <coughs> Madness. C completely contrary to government policy. Absolutely what the local authorities up and down the land ignoring completely the direction of government um, approach because of the complaints and discussions we've been having here w was going in. Local government kind of has these wheels that turn, ignoring uh, what's happening on the national stage. But in the positive column, and why you should trust institutions sometimes, we were able, as an as a elected authority, to debate it and argue about it in the way that we're arguing about these things here on a Sunday morning in the Barbican, and get that changed. So sometimes you can get a good result. And lastly, I know quick, I've gone quick, on. Quick, quick. Lastly, I love that point about public art. And um, you remember in The Wire, the very first, oh, Tories always get in trouble talking about The Wire, um, but the first scene of The Wire pans from a massive piece of monolithic concrete public art that's been dumped on this um, ghetto in Baltimore and scans out to a crime scene. No one really remarks on it, but it's clear that I think the directors were saying to them, you know, look what the authorities said, you can have this wonderful public art, that'll improve your quality of life. Blam, 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 blam. Uh. <laughs> on the question of what is trust, a, po a Polish sociologist described trust as a bet about the future contingent on the actions of others. And I think that's a pretty good description, but the problem for us today is that second part, contingent on the actions of others, because that's... The, we live in an era in which it's very difficult, actually, to take for granted uh, how other people will behave or how you relate to those people. And I think that's down to the fact that there has been a corrosion in old, informal institutions that were built on social solidarity, which alienates people from each other and makes it more difficult for them to trust. The problem, then, is that the authorities exploit and exacerbate that through the way in which they try and tap into the public in the, in the modern era, as I was saying earlier. In relation to the whistleblowers... Um, I, I really don't like whistleblowers, and I particularly don't like the cult that has emerged around them, because I think what it's given rise to is basically institutionalised disloyalty, where we're constantly inviting people, actively inviting them to squeal on what's happening at their workplace, what their fellow workers are doing, and I think it encourages um, disloyalty, and I think it also gives rise to a new form of authority. Uh, and in this case, the, the whistleblower, who's now treated as a kind of god. If you look at the way in which Edward Snowden is talked about, or Bradley Manning, or in the old days, before he got up to his shenanigans, Julian Assange, they're treated as these white saviours who uh, are revealing to us, the ignorant mob, the truth about what's happening in institutions. So again and again, I see uh, people uh, taking on this radical pose of challenging old authority, 
but in fact they were helping to instill new ones. For example, the whistleblower. Or they challenge the institution of the family and they give rise to the authority of the super nanny and the parenting guru. Or they challenge the uh, uh, trust in politicians, it gives rise to NGOs and quangos and lords and various other undemocratic elements. So okay, the okay, new okay, forms right, of authority right. are something that we should also challenge. I'm interested in accountability. <laughs> I mean, it seems to me that we live in an era where we have a lot of formal accountability, but it seems to me that what no we need is real accountability and moral courage. I mean, what is, why would you have to, why, uh, why report something anonymously when you could just go to the person leaving the piles and piles of, of dishes in the woman's room and say, what are you playing at? You know, where is, where is the alternative um, that is organic? I sympathise with Brendan's uh, scepticism about whistleblowers as they've emerged, <clears throat> but perhaps I'd suggest that they are the sort of vestiges of individuals who might formerly have used their common sense, their initiatives, their sense of honour. That has been taken away from them by institutions which have put their trust in forms, uh, boxes to tick, and therefore individuals no longer feel that they need to um, rely on their, their own common sense. They rely simply on ticking the box. Once they've done it, they feel that's the job Ooh. done. We've emasculated Ooh. individuals. Hmm. It seems that there must be some sort of relationship between authority and trust. And I'm wondering if the panel can say anything about this. Because from my experience, if you have someone who has got a sense of authority, which has got some depth to it, then they trust you more and you can trust them. So if you have a senior, for example, who's weak, what they usually do is they grass you up to the person above them and then it creates a problem. But if they're quite strong and have a sense of their own authority, it's different. And I think in relationships between adults and children, it's similar and it seems to allow a certain amount of flexibility rather than a kind of zero tolerance approach which doesn't appear to allow any form of trust and flexibility, so there just there seems to be quite a symbiotic relationship. I think uh, what's happening is that this very element in our society has become overinflated. I mean, the moment that politicians started talking about trust instead of democracy a lot more, uh, it makes us all wonder why, you know? Um, to the point as well that this, this word is overused as a kind of lazy term to mean what exactly? Um, is when people start saying, including on the panel, for trust, we need more trust. What? <laughs> um, sorry, that's a tautology. No, uh, we have to define what we mean and stop making it a sort of catch-all term for everything and anything. So, for example, when the politicians started talking so much about trust five or six years ago, um, we should be suspicious of that and go, well, why aren't they talking about what democracy means? why they are not inspiring us with ideas that would automatically make us trust them if we agreed and were inspired by them, and things like that. Um, and the second thing is that, of course, when this term is used, we just need more trust here and trust there. Um, we have a very real erosion of real needs, which are democratic relations, relations of justice between each other, which, as Brendan has pointed out, are being, you know, collapsing without much debate before our eyes. That is seriously worrying. My point is really about the corrosion of everyday authority and expertise, and it's not really in that sense, um, I, I work in a university as well, it's not about um, exposing mistakes or bad practice, it's a much more pervasive sense that our students are vulnerable, that we must build their confidence and their self-esteem, we've got to give them good qualifications for social mobility, we've got to satisfy them in the National Student Satisfaction Survey. And what that does is what this, the, the first speaker referred to, is on an everyday level we are slowly losing our educational authority and expertise. We don't challenge them because we don't want them to rate us badly, we don't want to make them feel vulnerable. The meaning of discrimination is changing fundamentally in universities. It can just mean mm. I offended you or I made you feel undermined or unconfident. It's not just about sort of overt levels of discrimination or meanings of discrimination. So I think we have to look at trust being eroded on a much more informal, insidious, everyday level. And that is about also undermining our authority and expertise. And that's very serious. I really uh, so agree with them. I want to sort of follow on that, what the last speaker was saying about the informal aspect of this, because it does seem to me the most insidious part of this is, is just not trusting yourself. 
And you really do see that in education, where things like the old radical language and sets of ideas and frameworks of discrimination, what they're doing is really encouraging young people to redefine, to every experience they have from, you know, a friend having an argument with a friend to what they might read or, or, or what they see on the news, everything is, they're being directed towards seeing it in a very, very specified way. And that way is not organic to the way they might feel without that framework being imposed upon them. So it's not empowering, it's not liberating, it's actually very, very stifling and restricting. And I think the difficult thing, I think what Brendan talked about it in his last, um, last point, is that trust actually, you need, you can't have trust if you don't have uncertainty. And when you're constantly mm. trying to mm. strive for certainty, mm. certainty, strive for perfection, not allow any space um, for errors, as, as um, mm. I think Jill, you were, were mm. pointing out, then, then you actually erode the need for trust and you won't get it. And lastly, very briefly, um, whistleblowing, why should it be easy? I'm not quite sure why it should be an easy thing. I think there's a lot to be said of if you are in a very difficult situation and it's tricky, to have to think very, very long and hard. What, what is important? What is really going on here? Who, where does a real problem lie? Who's going to help me in this? Who can I look for for support? And if you try and you know, say, well, we've got to make it easy, I think the danger is you're just going to bring in another layer of bureaucratic, you know, kind of watchdogs to check that you're making whistleblowing easy, rather than actually um, encouraging individuals to trust themselves a bit. I think like, it's true that trust is being undermined through like, making relationships problematic, but I think on an institutional level we've seen you know, with this idea of the information society that like information and knowledge is being and intellectual property is being further centralised into you know institutions such as this, the universities and the NHS, and that actually this is kind of like re rebuilds like a, a blind faith or a, a blind trust in uh, especially the NHS. You know, people are going to the doctor more and more just for the most you know banal and stupid things like you know. Um, stubbed your toe or something, you know, silly like that. So I'd, I'd like to, you know, pose that actually uh, trust or blind trust is being um, reaffirmed through this kind of centralisation of knowledge in certain institutions. One of the factors that I think contributes perhaps most to the climate of mistrust, I think, is, is what I would call dehumanisation. I say that a few examples perhaps. The medical profession has come up a lot, the NHS, and one thing that always strikes me when you go into the NHS or go into a hospital or to a doctor's or the ambulance service or in the police, and increasingly, um, you know, chiropractors and lots of other people who you have to come into contact for some medical reason, everybody wears gloves. It's like, I don't know if that contributes to stopping disease, but it certainly makes you feel like you're kind of diseased, uh, you know, in, in some form or other. And it's a small, I mean, I don't know how important it is, but... Uh, it always makes me feel that way. Yeah. And um, another example is, you know, the environmental movement, who is constantly saying, you know, we are uh, sort of this kind of bunch of people who are becoming increasingly obese and depraved and sort of, you know, not, not sort, of, sort of fit for a sort of, you know, a decent sort of society in the way we behave. Or, you know, the sex scandals exactly. that people have talked about you know, where we cannot be trusted to sort of even in the, in, in, in the confines of our own family. It's a growing dehumanisation of people which must, at the end of the day, contribute to this whole process. That's really significant. OK, very quickly. In an atmosphere of cynicism, I think I just want to ask the question, in an atmosphere of trust, what would a shared sense of responsibility look like towards risk-taking between public and the institution? And particularly, I want to ask that question to Paul and Brendan. Alex, your final thought, please. I'd like to finish by thinking about the question posed to us about accountability. Uh, and I think that we don't really... We have accountability in form in society now, but not in content. Um, accountability without responsibility, I suppose. Um, and when someone goes on to uh, the Today programme, and you hear, you hear this most weeks, if not most days, they say, I take responsibility. What they mean is, I don't take responsibility. You know, because if you say to them, well, do you accept the blame then? They say, well, probably not. 
you know, and if you do accept responsibility, what are the consequences for you then? Well, we're going to learn the lessons and we're going to implement the learnings that have come from the inquiry, uh, rather than genuine accountability, which must, I think, involve some responsibility. And it's that absence of responsibility that means we um, have diminishing trust in institutions, not because people challenge the institutions more, that's a good thing, but because in reality, they, they often don't perform, and when they fail to perform, they fail to take uh, responsibility. And it's thinking about that too, that I, I think I probably, I've realised throughout the session why I disagree with Brendan on, on whistleblowers. And it's that I think there's a conflation, not deliberate of course, but a conflation of the difference between encouraging people to fear and look for illusory problems, uh, to, to encouraging people to fear and look for illusory problems, the posters, um, for example, and genuine problems, you know, for which people should always have recourse and the ability to speak out. We should tr seek to minimise our ridiculous confection of the former whilst giving full-throated support to those who bravely speak out in situations like Southern Cross in the latter. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, Victor, please. There's a couple of things. The first is, I'm just responding in some ways to the point that was made by the uh, woman uh, from the uh, education institution. I happen to be involved in the education institution now, and I think there is something about, um, there is something about the burger flipping of professional values and opinion. And what I mean by that is that in times of economic constraint, or where you've got companies that are driven by profit, what they do is that they, they take out judgment for everything because judgment takes time. And so what they want you to do is, is take the box, flip the burger to the left or the right and move on because that's quick. And I think there's some of that going on in educational institutions. And, and I think that is, that is to, be, to be resisted. I think that what I said, and the young lady, uh, the young chap who was talking about um, services that you want, actually what I should have said is, and, and, and some of this is, um, when I listen to this debate, is actually people get the leadership that they deserve. And I think there is something about, if you're a member of an institution, which uh, I would include society, when you walk past a quality problem, when you walk past a problem, when you don't take responsibility for uh, some responsibility for being part of that problem and or resolving it, then I, I think there's a sense in which you're adding to it. Yeah. And so we come full circle, in a way, back to the citizen and back to what the citizen should expect, what the citizen can ask for and what leadership should do in partnership with citizens to improve trust. Thank you very much, Victor. Uh, Jill? I'm not sure we do get the leadership we deserve, actually. I think we deserve better leadership of a lot of political, a lot of public, uh, public institutions uh, than we do. So, and I think it does a lot go to that. I think, basically, at the end of the day, what you want is institutions you can have confidence in, um, but I think you also want, you don't want sort of arrogant institutions, you want uh, quite humble institutions. So you want arrogant institutions you can have confidence in, but where you know that they're prepared to have people point out that actually they aren't doing some things quite right and they could do things better. Um, I'm with Alex on whistleblowers. I think that, uh, that actually just to pretend that the whistleblowers are the problem, not the problems the problem, is actually an easy cop-out. Of course. Thank you very much, Paul. So no um, just two simple <laughs> points. Uh, one, because we cannot and should not try and contractualise things in life, Trust is actually, the way I think of it, is the glue that underpins so much social interactions. That's why you need trust. It's what underpins life. Um, in terms of trusting people, the questions around accountability and risk-taking, um, I think people, if they're going to be accountable, need the responsibility and the power to do things, and therefore, by definition, you have trusted those people. So part of my speech when I was talking earlier about um, to trust people, you've got to trust them, it's not glib. What it does mean is you have to pass that responsibility down they, in turn, have to show why they deserve that trust. What are they putting in place? What's their moral responsibility? What's the, what their professional bodies doing to deserve that trust? It's a two-way street. Thank you very much. Brendan? Um, well, I just think whistleblowing has become a, a stand-in for proper democratic debate. I think it, it, it's a stand-in for those old relationships that used to exist in workplaces and elsewhere, where people would come together and resolve problems in their workplace or in society. And now we fall back on the one man who can enlighten us all about what's going wrong. And I think the celebration of that actually gives rise to a really elitist form that. of politics, the idea that we need to have the truth revealed to us by these individuals. It's a really dangerous idea, and it exacerbates the crisis of trust because we are encouraged through this process to suspect all institutions. I just think the crisis of trust is a real problem 
And I think it cannot be separated from the fact that human beings today are generally seen as toxic creatures. We're seen as being toxic on the planet, toxic on our children, toxic on uh, each other. And that idea, which um, the authorities have done a fair deal to uh, promote, is the thing which makes us not trust ourselves and it's the thing that makes us not trust other people. And John Stuart Mill said it's only through exercising and using your moral muscles through making a choice about how to live your life, that you become a responsible being. So it's this hampering of people's trust in themselves is the thing that is making it impossible for us to take responsibility for our lives and our responsibility for our destinies. Uh, brilliant panel, can we thank them please?